Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com and the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 120, first in the canon. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became astronomer. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the big Bigger Street Irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Yes, sir. That's my baby. No, oh, no, sir. Don't mean maybe. Welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. And I'm Bert Walder. And we mentioned firsts in the canon and how appropriate that we are the first podcast about Sherlock Holmes for Sherlock Holmes devotees. Mm. And and I'm, I'm glad I was the first to be able to say that. Yes, first, 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 first in um, first in war, first in peace, first, first in, in the heart of, of this country, first in the heart of the cannon. Yes, indeed. Well, how have you been, Sir Bert? I've been well, and we had a chance to see each other at the Speckled Band meeting a, recently. Within the la- oh my goodness, is it only within the last week? Seems like a century. Ago. I know, I know. Uh, speaking of first, that 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 scion being, of course, the first uh, scion of the Baker Street Irregulars. Um, now, technically, you, you'll hear the five orange pips say that they were the first scion of the Baker Street Irregulars in in one side of their mouth. Out of the other side of their mouth, you'll hear them say that they actually predated uh, the Baker Street Irregulars and are. Uh, superior to them in some ways. Well, if if you want to split hairs, then I suppose you could say that the Speckled Band of Boston was the first Scion Society of the Baker Street Irregulars from outside of the New York area. So that's well, that. That's, well, that's was how there we... a Scion of the Baker Street Irregulars inside the New York area? Well, the Five Orange Pips. Oh, right. Five oranges. It's up for well, grabs, look, I'm, really. I'm more caught up with the idea of talking out of one side of my mouth to say this and the other side of my mouth to say that. When I try this, I wind up with peanuts all over my shirt. <laughs> Which is strange very, since very you, were, you were eating pretzels when you began. So Well, that, and that's why. What a mess. Right? Mm. Um, but, you know, it, it, it may be worth a bit of uh, brief discussion here before we jump into first in the canon uh, to talk about uh the, the the speckled band which by the way if you haven't had a chance to hear our episode on the speckled band it's mm. episode 77 the easiest way to get to it is to either go through your podcatcher iTunes etc and look for episode 77 or just type in 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 your browser all lowercase letters ihose.co slash ihose 77. Uh, All one word. That will, yes. Yeah. That will get you right to, uh, our overview of the Speckled Band and interview with Dan Poznanski, longtime, uh, member and leader, uh, within the ranks of the Speckled Band, the current keeper of the band. So check that out. Um, now at this year's Speckled Band, uh, dinner, and there was a little bit of a flurry online about it. Uh, there was a, uh, a historic vote that was taken. Uh, and the vote was to remove the gender requirements from the bylaws in the speckled band. 
Uh, of course, this had been one of the longest standing all male Sherlock Holmes societies. Of course, it had for about the last 40 years or so had the friends of Irene Adler across the river in Cambridge, uh, meeting, uh, the opposite end of the calendar year as the band. Um, so there, there was an opportunity for both sexes to take part in Sherlockian fellowship and scholarship. But the band itself had remained elusive to women who wanted uh, to participate. And now that veil has been lifted. So um, there is the opportunity next year to welcome, with open arms, uh, some of uh, the, those of the female persuasion to our midst. Mm. And it should yeah. be a good time. As long, hey, look, as long as they like steak and kidney pie, then, hey, fine with me. I'm really, though, I have to tell you, I'm really concerned about this. You know, I know that I know that we had this unanimous vote, but it seems to me that future meetings are just not going to be the same. For example, next year, yeah, we're all going to have to wear pants. (laughs) And I mean, that just that just seems to be a fundamental change in the great airy freedoms of the speckled band that we've enjoyed over the years that we never talk oh i'm sorry we never talk about we forget never, i said anything and we never mention aunt clara no i'll cut that out we'll just edit that out <laughs> <laughs> uh, it should be good well you know even though we don't mention aunt clara you know who we do mention oh who do we mention our great friends at wessex press Some people say Mother's Day began in ancient Greece, but in the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex, we know better. With our three-day festival of Hilaria, honoring Magna Mater, our great mother, our traditions date back to 250 BCE. But you don't need to go back that far to enjoy dreams of future past, the science fiction worlds of Arthur Conan Doyle and H.G. Wells by Dana Martin Batori. Great essays that explore tales of alien invasion, time travel, bizarre genetic experiments, global ecological disaster, and technology so powerful the very building blocks of matter crumble. Yeah, I know. Sounds a lot like the daily headlines. But it's yours for a mere thirteen ninety five from our Wessexpress.com. Clear, translucent runs the river. Our greened canopies cool shades deliver. It's May, the perfect time to reach for the pleasure only a volume from the Wessex Press can provide. Choose yours today. Well, it's always great to hear what you're able to pull out of the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex. Yeah. How they get ink and paper for their books is just beyond me. It's, it's amazing, and that's, that's why you need to support them, friends. Mm. And while you're supporting them, hey, consider supporting us, too. Head mm-hmm. on over to IHearOfSherlock.com. Hit that orange Patreon button to help support the site and the show. What you do when you uh, become a patron of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is you say, yes, I believe in the audio programming here. I believe in what Bert and Scott are doing. I want to be a part of their success. I want to hitch my wagon to their star. <laughs> God, God help you. And we welcome that. It doesn't matter if it's a dollar an episode, five dollars an episode, ten, twenty-five, whatever you can afford uh, to show your support. And look, if you're not in a per episode sponsorship um, mode or modality, that's okay. We have a PayPal button there too. If you'd like to uh, make a one-time donation to us, like people like. Uh, James O'Leary have done that and Ron Lees. They've been very generous, uh, with their sensibilities and their sense. So we would invite you to do the same. I hear of Sherlock.com. Pick the button of your choice. Well, moving away from buttons and into, you know, kind of more of those blue ribbon awards, the ribbons, the awards for achievement. We we have a number of awards for canonical achievement to hand out tonight, don't we? <laughs> canonical achievement. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. Should we, you know, should we get uh, the uh, the Oscar music ready? <laughs> yes, 
Yes, folks, they're coming in off the red carpet as we speak. Here into the Helen Hayes Theater in New York City. You can see them strutting proudly past the paparazzi, past the adoring fans. It's all of these things in the canon we wish to celebrate that have made an impact, the things that have come first, that no one, no one has done before. That Sherlock Holmes, in his wisdom, in his advancement in the science and art of detection, has seen fit to embrace before anyone else here at Awards Night. So what do you say, Bert? What are we going to start with? Well, I think the award for great innovations goes to Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street for the use of forensic evidence. Oh, that's a good start. I like um, that. Mystery story. Now, we I, we should preface this by saying that we welcome your comments because we think there are a number of firsts, obviously, and you may have experience with some of these things featured in earlier cases, events, mystery stories, and, and we would love for you to correct the record. But it certainly seems to me that Holmes was at the forefront of forensic evidence in his cases as well as in practical use of fingerprinting, observing, gathering evidence and samples, measurements, footprints mm. all seem to be hallmarks of Sherlock Holmes. Well, and we, we certainly get a taste of that right out of the gate in A Study in Scarlet. Um, before we even know the identity of Enoch Drebber and Jefferson Hope, uh, Holmes is referring to Mr. Square Toes as he's walking <laughs> around um, uh, the, the murder scene in, what was that, the Brixton Road? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the first yeah. appearance actually of a cartoon character in any mystery story, SpongeBob uh, Square Toes. <laughs> oh, man. I say, Watson, I believe there's a small pet snail here named Gary. Holmes, you amaze me. <laughs> um, but, but right in, uh, in one of those opening scenes there, you know, we've got, well, not, not the opening chapter. I think it was maybe chapter three by the time he uh, got around to it, uh, where Holmes was, uh, you know, taking a look at, uh, obviously, at the bloodstains on the wall. The, um, uh, the, the, the dust on the floor, which allowed him to track many of these, um, uh, many of these clues in, uh, I, I guess it was in Lauriston Garden, not, not the Brixton Road, uh, mm. if I'm, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, but, um, the Lauriston Garden mystery, right? Yes. So, um, you know, he identified that, uh, the murderer was, uh, more than, Six feet high in the prime of life, had small feet for his height, wore coarse, square-toed boots, and smoked a Trichinopoly cigar. And all of those he had deduced simply by looking at the footprints in the dust and obviously looking at the um, the ash left behind by the cigar and, and also simply knowing where the, um, where, where the word racha had been written on the wall. Uh, obviously that helped him determine the height, uh, which was backed up by the stride of, uh, of the man that the, the distance between his footprints helped Holmes to determine his height as well. Um, unless that, that is, unless he was a man with extraordinarily long legs and a squat torso. <laughs> uh, but Holmes, he, he used the footprints, the stride and the height of the, uh, of the word imprinted on the wall to back up his assertions there. And, and of course, in looking at the, uh, at the Trichinopoly cigar, uh, or look, I should say looking at the ashes of the Trichinopoly cigar, um, that was, that was easy. Um, because he had at that point done his monograph on how many forms of 140, 140 varieties of cigars, cigarettes and pipe ash um in this case he said i gathered some scattered ash from the floor it was dark in color and flaky uh, how odd for ashes to be dark in color and flaky um such an ash is only made by a trichinopoly i've made a special study of cigar ashes in fact i've written a monograph on the subject 
I flatter myself that I can distinguish at a glance the ash of any known brand, either of cigar or of tobacco. Mm. So that was an instance early on where Holmes was using this kind of forensic evidence to help advance his career and his uh, his profession. Mm. Are there other uh, other stories where we see Holmes uh, relying on footprints? Oh, sure. Well, it's throughout the canon in one way or another that hallmark of observation, recording facts and details that uh, was a first and was emulated in future by so many other detectives, mm. particularly Austin Freeman's Dr. Thorndike, the first medico legal jurist who carried around a little green case so that he could, with a small microscope and other things, so he could actually do detailed studies on, on crime scenes. But of course, in Silver Blaze, you know, as one example, which yes. also gets you down to the Dunlop tire treads and the controversial claim that by the wear of one tread versus another, you could determine which direction a bicycle was going, which people have objected to over the years. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Silver Blaze and throughout the canon, you have this uh, accumulation of information. I guess um, one of the other early stories that uh, we see footprints used in was um, uh, the Boscombe Valley mystery. Uh, right at the edge of the mirror uh, where McCarthy had been uh, murdered, uh, Holmes again looked at the uh, looked at the footprints, the boot marks, uh, and saw immediately that uh, they did not match those of young McCarthy, uh, or at least some of the tracks did not did not match young McCarthy. There were two sets of footprints there, uh, mm -hmm. other than the murdered man, and uh, Holmes was able to determine when. One went there when one was waiting. Again, this is an instance of cigar ash being uh, helpful as well. We see that as well in, uh, oh, probably the most famous use of footprints in the canon. When Sir Charles was waiting at the gate at the end of the <laughs> U Alley in the Hound of the Baskervilles, um, Dr. Mortimer had, had inspected the footprints there. And he, uh, he saw that he paced for a while and he could tell how long Sir Charles had waited there. Holmes said, well, how did you know? Well, by the amount of cigar ash that he left there. And that was similar to uh, Holmes's observation of those footprints behind the tree in the Boscombe Valley mystery. Someone was, was hiding in, in uh, it just waiting uh, and hiding for uh, the right moment. And, of course, he used the, uh, the grass still growing underneath the rock that he found as evidence that the rock itself was used for uh, the murder. It had been dislodged from somewhere else and then placed down on the grass, and the grass underneath it was still uh, was still alive. And he determined that meant that it wasn't in its original place. Well, and that gets you to one of the great iconic moments in the canon where Dr. Mortimer ends that, that chapter by saying, Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a gigantic hound. Uh, still sends chills up my spine to hear that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So, you know, footprints again and again, we see them uh, almost as uh, the hallmark of uh, of Sherlock Holmes, kind of his calling card for uh, being able to tell uh, who was what and where. It always well, Holmes, yeah, Holmes uh, was also, in terms of firsts, he was also a vigorous user of technology. It may be hmm. the first appearance of the telephone in – uh, a mystery story, or maybe not. You know, the telephone had been coming in in the late 19th century in England. But certainly the first, I would think, the first appearance of a phonograph of a record player in, in Mazarin's Stone, particularly as a, a plot element that was used to suggest Holmes was someplace playing the violin when he was really someplace else. Hmm. Well, let's... Um let, let's track back there um, because I'm intrigued by the use of the telephone. And you, Bert, as a telephone man, um, a, 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 a gent who worked a good amount of your career in uh, – Yeah, a big chunk yeah, yeah, in communications. It wasn't only at and I mean were you there for the Bell uh, days or is that before your time? No, I was there for that. I was there for the first international subsidiary back when it was still an integrated company, back when we worked through the uh, – the breakup of the bell system. And, you know, it's been all downhill ever since. Then, <laughs> I must say. 
Uh, yeah. So um, the first mention of a telephone in the canon. Do you do you know how early uh, how how far back it goes in in the stories in their order of publication? No, I don't remember. Oh, I would have thought you would have made a study of this. No, I meant to look it up, but uh, okay. Failed. Well, here's uh, I will give you this should give it away uh, based on the excerpt that I'm using, but uh, we'll, we'll let our we'll let our listeners play along before you uh, before you chime in. Um. Never mind. We shall give you two others in place of them, but you must put yourself under my orders. You are welcome to all official credit, but you must act on the lines that I point out. Is that agreed? Entirely, if you will help me to the men. Well, then, in the first place, I shall want a fast police boat, a steam launch, to be at the Westminster Stairs at 7 o'clock. Oh, oh, that is easily managed. Uh, there's early, always huh? one about there, but I can step across the road and telephone to make sure. Oh, excellent. So that's 1890. Well, that's actually before 1890, right? That's sign of four. Yeah, that is exactly. That was 18, 1890. That's right. Well, the, well it was but, published but, in 1890. Uh, our our, published our chronologists believe that yes. took place in September of 1888. 88, that's right. And that really was early day. Well, the telephone was invented. There's a <laughs> some argument about the development of the telephone, but what? Alexander Graham Bell in How the is States. How is that possible? Uh, yeah, hard to believe. Alexander Graham Bell in the States um, invented the telephone in 1876, and at around the same time, Eduardo Miucci was busy inventing the telephone in Italy, huh. and Thomas Edison was also uh, poking around. And from there, it got to England, I think, in the early, maybe the late 18s, no, 1870, I think it was the late 1870s, early 1880s. Hmm. So there you have. It's still fairly uh, There early could not on. have been very many people on the telephone exchange in London in 1888. That is true. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wrong number again. Um, I don't think they had uh, pad dial back then. I think it was, uh, <laughs> I, as a matter of fact, it wasn't even rotary back then, was it? Oh, no, no. The, the invention of the rotary dial, no, it was still... Uh, a, it was still copper wires above ground, yeah. and it was uh, uh, human operators that would have to, you know, you'd call a central office where someone would pick up a plug and connect you to another subscriber. Yeah. Well, the next mention of the telephone uh, was in uh, the collection of stories called "The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes," and again, we'll see if you can suss out where this comes from. Uh, ah, I wish to have a word with you, Bradstreet. Oh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. Step into my room here. It was a small office-like room with a huge ledger upon the table and a telephone projecting from the wall. The inspector sat down at his desk. Oh, well, that's Inspector Bradstreet, certainly, but I don't remember which uh, case that lines up with. Well, Holmes was there at uh, at the police station Let's to help it. clean up one Hugh Boone. Oh, yeah, Twisted Lip. The man with Wasn't the that interesting? Lip. That's right. But I was thinking more of a telephone actually appearing in Baker Street. That's right. That meant that Holmes was a subscriber. But the Twisted Lip, actually, chronologists say it would be June of 1887. Of course, the police service would have been, you know, the first, particularly in Britain, where the uh, posts and telegraphs, where the post office controlled the deployment of uh, telephony. Well, I think uh, the phone in uh, the phone in Baker Street. I don't think we get to that until much later in the yeah. canon, at least from a from a publication standpoint. Um, let's see. Uh, the telephone directory lay on the table beside me, and I turned over the pages in a rather hopeless quest. But to my amazement, there was a strange name in its due place. I gave a cry of triumph. Here you are, Holmes. Here it is. Holmes took the book from my hand. Garadeb, M. <laughs> well, that's 1902, according to the chronologist, the three Garadebs. That is correct. Which you can find in the case book. How interesting. How interesting. So Garadeb, well, and clearly Holmes had a telephone directory, so he must have, he must have had a telephone by man. virtue of uh, deduction. It was also in um, The Retired Colorman. 
uh, where Holmes said, um, uh, it's been done. Thanks to the telephone and the help of the yard, I can usually get my essentials without leaving this room. He was becoming quite a Mycroft by that point. July of 1898, mm-hmm. according to chronologists for uh, the retired Coleman. That's right. And when Sir James Damery came to visit Holmes in the illustrious client, uh, he left a note and he says he trusts, therefore, that Mr. Holmes will make every effort to grant this interview and we, he, he will confirm it over the telephone to the Carlton Club. 1902. Yeah. Mm. And, and, of course, uh, Holmes, as, as Damery left their appointment, he said, how shall I keep in touch with you? And Damery said, the Carlton Club will find me. But in case of emergency, there is a private telephone call, XX31. <laughs> and Holmes noted it down. Now, I've got a, I've got a riddle for you. Who had uh, national telephone number 77? National? In the U.S.? No, in England. In England. National telephone number 77? Yes. On you the did, you just telephone, telephone exchange. 77? Yeah. The Queen? No, Arthur Conan Doyle. Did he really? That was Conan Doyle's phone. Yeah, he had stationery at oh. Crowbar in Sussex. And in the upper right-hand corner, he had uh, how you could send him a telegram. You could, you could telegram to him at Crowbar, and I, it would be delivered. Or you could call him on the national telephone, number 77. That was his phone number at Windlesham. How about that? That is something. Well, you know, in, in our discussions of, you know, kind of a modern-day homes, would he use email? Would he use Twitter? Would he use text? And, and all cell the, phones. Sure, cell mobile. phones. Right? All the tools we have at our disposal today. I think uh, the, the most evidence is that, uh, th- that, we, um, uh, that, that, that we take from the original canon was that uh, Holmes would – he would never write when a telegram would suffice. I believe that's how the quote goes. Or would, yeah. would never write when a telegram would Take serve. Yeah. Um, that he, he appreciated the, uh, the brevity. He appreciated the speed at which they could be dispatched, uh, certainly over great distances or when some uh, messengers are dealing with traffic in the city. Uh, it's a it's an important part of communications history. People tend to forget. Just this past week, we've had some email traffic about a particular postcard that Christopher Morley hmm. sent to, I think, a fellow at Scribner's. But the interesting thing is that Morley typed out a postcard in 1946 and put it in the mail. It was a penny postcard. And in those days, so that was the equivalent of a text message, and it hmm. cost a penny to deliver. Okay. And telegrams were an early form of Twitter messages. You know, you've got 140 characters on Twitter, and you paid by the word. Yes. In uh, Which telegram I, days, and I, so you. I always got a kick out of how in the in the Jeeves and Worcester stories, or you know, the various Woodhouse stories, how some of his more daft characters would send telegrams that. Rather than use fewer words, they almost used more. <laughs> uh, remembering that uh, you know they were paying by the word, I always got a, uh, I got a kick out of that. And in their time, you know, the Western Union Company was an innovator from the standpoint of marketing messages. You know, today we, as you well know, we wrestle and explore with how to handle advertising and promotional messages in mobile media. And on Snapchat and things like that. Well, Western Union was the m- among the first to offer businesses the opportunity to take a standard promotional message and send it to a variety of people, kind of like an email list today, hmm. at a standard rate. And to and to give you, to, if you were tongue tied, didn't know what to write for your mother on Mother's Day, <laughs> they would have a series of prepackaged discount telegrams you could send. Uh, you know. Suggesting your love to mom and so on. Yeah. Well, speaking of prepackaged discount messages, here's one now. When it comes to firsts, there's nothing like the Baker Street Journal, the first and longest running publication of Sherlockian scholarship. When Edgar Smith started the presses at the BSJ in 1946, proudly proclaiming the game's afoot, 
it was the perfect time for the world to welcome writings about the writings. In his very first gas lamp, Edgar noted, No other man has ever been so honored before him, but then no other life has ever lent itself so completely to affectionate dissection. No other times have offered quite so full a flavor of the stuff of which our dreams are made. And so it is that the dreams live on in our educated reverie about what might have transpired, what may have inspired, and that to which we may aspire. Every quarter, the Baker Street Journal arrives with its array of insights, suppositions, and learned treatises on everything from tennis shoes to Victorian sanitation, from new Sherlockian publications to light-hearted takes on canonical life in comics and cartoons. If you haven't subscribed to the Baker Street Journal yet, make this your very first year to do so. With any luck, it won't be your last. Check it out now and mention iHose when you check out at BakerStreetJournal.com. Now you know we just we just mentioned telegrams, and uh, I did a quick search. How many times do you think the word telegram was mentioned in the canon? Oh boy, I would think. Let's see, 50, uh, 56 short stories and four novels. Mm-hmm. I would say it wouldn't be too much to say 60 times. Hmm. It's not bad. 97. Ah. 97. Uh, and it looks like it was probably, mm, roughly speaking, about half the stories. Hmm. There's a telegram mentioned, maybe a little – maybe fewer than that, slightly fewer. But first one was mentioned in um, – Study in Scarlet, actually four times in Study in Scarlet. Uh, telegram to Cleveland, uh, which obviously was the easiest way to get overseas information in a uh, relatively speedy fashion. And um, the very first mention is uh, it was one o'clock when we left number three, Lauriston Gardens. Sherlock Holmes led me to the nearest telegraph office, whence he, whence he dispatched a long telegram. So that was his note back to Cleveland. At that point, I have a book somewhere of famous telegrams over the years hmm. that I've hung on to. But my favorite telegram memory is it's probably apocryphal. But the story is that some publicity agent in New York sent a telegram to California trying to find out Cary Grant's age. And so the telegram said, how old Cary Grant? Question mark. <laughs> and it, it, at the other end, it was delivered to Cary Grant, who, who telegrammed back, old Cary Grant, fine. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Mm. And of course, you know, the first, uh, the first exchange over the telegraph from uh, Samuel Morse, right? Uh yeah, it's not what hath God wrought. That is it's, right. It is? What yeah. hath God wrought. Mm. And did you see when um, former Twitter businessman Biz Stone was on the Colbert Report? Uh, Colbert asked Biz what the first tweet was, and he was having trouble remembering, and uh, and Colbert prompted him. He said, it wasn't what hath God twat. <laughs> What hath God twit? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that is very indicative of the environment in the 1890s, being confronted with these amazing inventions that dramatically made it easier to communicate with people or reduce distance. Mm-hmm. And the telephone bell to get popular uh, enthusiasm around the telephone would participate in various conventions or demonstrations. And so he would – his base at the time was in Boston and he would have a line set up between Boston and another city and invite people in. And, and I remember one of those early newspaper articles about it reported one of these demonstrations Bell would do. And the reporter noted that after a little conversation, Bell put on some, a French speaker hmm. who talked to, to another French speaker at this far distant city. So the telephone even works in French. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, but, that's, but you had you know you had no experience of of speaking over a wire to somebody yeah. else. So. I I understand. 
And in yeah. fact, he would show it. And, you know, somebody every so often, somebody would say to him, so, so Dr. Bell, the wires are hollow, are they? How, how? You know, nobody. It's kind of like that that old uh, trope about the internet is a bunch of tubes. A bunch of tubes, yeah, sure. The intertubes. Well, you know, when I was a kid, and and I would watch television reruns from my parents' childhood. You know, the Jack Benny program, the Honeymooners, Leave It to Beaver. Uh, it, it it got to a point. You know, I was uh, seven, eight years old, where I asked them, "So, when did your lives start being lived in color?" <laughs> <laughs> I just I thought that's the way it was back then. There was that there wasn't color. It was just you know. Mm. So well, uh we also mentioned uh or we're about to mention another uh another phone in the canon. You know, I have to tell you, back in those old days before they invented color, it was so much easier to do your laundry. <laughs> And get dressed in the morning. I mean, you know, my decisions were thing. white, gray. I mean, what am I going to put on? Yeah. Didn't have to worry yeah. about the green clashing with the orange or what have you. Yeah. Oh, and then you'd go to the department store and there was no cosmetics counter because, you know, who needed lipstick? Right. I mean, <laughs> right. Simpler times. I know. I know. If only. Mm. Uh, but the other phone in the canon was the gramophone. Yes. We have uh, an instance where... Holmes actually uh, fooled his prey, eluded his prey by uh, making it seem as if he was playing the violin in the next room when, in fact, it was a gramophone. Uh, and that's in the Mazarin Stone. That is And correct. that was a, a great uh, bit of stage business that Conan Doyle had invented for yes. a play called The Crown Diamond, which then became the story of the Mazarin Stone. Yeah. It was a clever use of the, of the new technology at the time. Um, that's one of the interesting things. So many things that were of interest to Conan Doyle wound up in the cases of Sherlock Holmes. For example, cycling. He was an early proponent of cycling. Hmm. Uh, it's odd, though, that some things – and obviously he was trained in the medical profession and inspired by Joseph Bell, who, as we've discussed many times, made a practice and a habit of detailed observation – but it's interesting the things that Conan Doyle was interested in that never pop up in the canon. For example, photography. He was a great um, mm. uh, enthusiast around photography in one time. Cricket. He was a – for his whole life, he was a yeah. – practically, he was a great cricket player. Football pops up, but not cricket. Um, there you are. Well, let's, let's be careful here because uh, while photography itself was not a subject – of any of the stories, it did play into a few of them. Um, take a scandal in Bohemia, for scandal. example. Sure, yeah. uh, photograph, the, the yeah. photograph was the uh, was the MacGuffin. Uh, well, actually, it wasn't the MacGuffin. It was it was the actual thing that Holmes was after, uh, which he he uh, ended up receiving in the end. It was uh, Arena's photograph in the end. Uh, but also remember uh, our friend in the Redheaded League who. Uh, kept using the photography excuse to go down into the basement. Oh, that's true. The darkroom, John Clay. John right. Clay. That's right. And and of course uh, another villain, um, Mister Rucastle in the Copper Beaches said photography right. is one of my hobbies. Yeah, an excuse so. not to go into the room because we have a dark room. Well, that's true. That's I hadn't right. thought about that's that. That's right. So it does. It's a, and, you know, the six Napoleons, he, he had the photograph uh, that was in the dead man's pocket. Um, so it does pop up from time to time. But again, it's it's more of, oh, what we might call a trifle. <laughs> Maybe that's a, a deeper subject for a show over on trifles if we really want to well, get into photography. Yeah. So I'm going to note that down. Uh, trifles photography. Got it. But, you know, the reason why I thought about it is, of course, in those days, it required so much stuff. I mean, you mm. were lugging around a heavy wooden box camera. You had treated plates. You had hoods. You had – I mean, it was it was you and 50 pounds of gear at minimum. Yeah. And, and all the bulbs uh, uh, or the, the powder uh, that went along with the flash at that point. And, of course, yeah. you, had, you had to carry around the man that went underneath the hood and that held that, uh, that flash bulb <laughs> up. So. Yeah, hmm. but you would have thought that there would have been some case where a long exposure captured some information. Of course, later yeah. in life, Conan Doyle sadly 
became connected with the Cottingsley Ferry photographs, which were proved to be forgeries, but yes, uh, or frauds. But you know. so photography, that's a, that's a good one. Although that's not, again, doesn't really play a role the way some of these other things uh, did. But what about mm. what about codes and ciphers? Codes and ciphers, yeah, big, obviously. You know, we have. Um, uh, codes in Dancing Man. We have codes in Valley of Fear. We have codes in Red Circle. We have plenty of codes. Yeah, and it's it's interesting that um, I'm wondering what that connection was. You know, of course, Conan Doyle was a member of the Portsmouth Scientific Society, mm. and as a medical man, he well, and, and through with his position in society, he also had many friends who were involved in the sciences but clearly somewhere along the line he picked up an interest in ciphers and an interest in how they could be uh broken it's it's uh i don't remember anything in any of the biographies that sort of tracked that back to anything particular in his life no no i don't either but we do know that it played a role in uh in world war one I. I think we mentioned in an earlier show of Conan Doyle, actually in a, in a trifle show, I believe, um, Conan Doyle using pinpricks under certain letters or certain words to uh, indicate uh, a secret message. And he, he would usually right. start in Chapter 3 or Chapter 4 of a book uh, because the, by, by that point the, uh, the code breakers would have given up if they didn't see anything. Right. Um, and there's there's been some relatively recent um, – Writing, particularly in the BSI publication, dancing, yes, to, dancing to dancing death, to death, dancing yes, to death, that suggests that he had encountered in one of his visits, uh, one of his pseudo holiday visits somewhere in England, he had he had encountered a, a code that looked like dancing men. Yeah, that's right. At a, at a hotel stay, I believe. Well, if if you do want to check that show out, I think Dancing to Death was episode one thirteen. Uh, if you want to go mm. back through our archives and and listen to that episode, it was an interview with um, uh, with Ray Betzner mm. about Dancing. And to is death. Are, are there codes too in Glorious Scott? Well, that was uh, that wasn't a code per se, as much as it was more of a cipher, I would think, where um, you know it was every third word. In the note, oh, right, uh, right. that one needed to discern. So it was it was a type of of, of code or cipher. Um, you know, just looking at um, looking at mentions of similar type things in the canon. Wasn't, there's wasn't there one in Red Circle with uh, yeah yeah Red Circle was there, the number of, um, of of flashes of the candle. Uh, that was really pretty yeah. silly. Uh, poor lock, of course, in Valley of Fear. The Orange Pips. The Orange Pips was a kind of code. Um, we had the, the naval signals mentioned in, uh, his last bow, his as last well bow, as right. auto parts that were put in various pigeonholes. Um, what else? Uh, the cross under the stamp in The Creeping Man. The Holmes mentioned cryptograms in The Sign of Four. Give me the most abstruse cryptograms. Uh, our own colors, green and white, in Wisteria Lodge, as the uh, as the code to take flight. Um. So yeah, oh, the Musgrave ritual itself was uh, was a coded message. When it, when it comes down to that, it was it, it was a uh, a treasure hunt. Mm. So now uh again you know conan doyle was on the earlier side of detective fiction of course uh wilkie collins edgar allan poe came before him um and and whether or not uh the sherlock holmes stories were the first to use this they certainly popularized them uh, in a number of ways and uh those in in this case that are th- those are poisons poisons used in the canon there were well, of course, uh, that the opening story, A Study in Scarlet, where yeah. uh, Jefferson Hope gave uh, Stangerson and Drebber a choice, a placebo or uh, the actual poison. Uh, so that was uh, the earliest use in the canon, but it, it does come up again, uh, poisons in the canon, uh, in, in uh, some other stories, such as? Sure. Devil's Foot, Speckled Band. Oh, yeah. 
Dying Detective. Speckled Band and um, and and Dying Detective, a couple of interesting ones because they are. Well, they are uh, poisons that one would come across normally. Uh, you know, a, a a a disease. In this case, it was a tropical disease, so it was not that common in London, unless you're down in the docks. And in the speckled band, um, it was simply venom from a snake. So things that could happen naturally that could easily be disguised as uh, a non-crime. Uh, and of course. Uh, the poison-tipped arrows that uh, Tonga used. And oh, right. That uh, were in a quiver in the household of the Fergusons in uh, Sussex Vampire. Hmm. So, again, very inventive, um, off-center uses of, uh, well, not, <laughs> not necessarily household goods, household items, but still things that... Uh, that that the general public would have been familiar enough with to understand the implications. Mm. Well, it's interesting how groundbreaking all this was and how much it influenced subsequent fiction. You know, when I think about the basic observation that when a doctor turns criminal, Mm. you know, he's the worst because he has nerve and knowledge. Yeah. Um, with what authority Conan Doyle was speaking and what it kicked off. You know, for example, uh, Dorothy Sayers in The Unpleasantness at the Bologna Club. Now, here's a spoiler alert if you haven't read The Unpleasantness at the Bologna Club. But the um, – well, I won't give away too much. But the that particular murder, which features Dorothy Sayers' detective, Lord Peter Whimsey, is engineered uh, and the victim is a very elderly man – who is who has a heart condition and who is not well, but who is urged uh, off the planet by uh, a dosage, a high dosage of digitalis. That would do it. Mm-hmm. That would do it. Um, and well, and of course, the um, the when a doctor goes wrong uh, comment, uh, Holmes included mentions of uh, some actual physicians that. Uh, did indeed go wrong uh, in in real life. Uh, it, it wasn't a, a matter of just pulling from uh, some fictional uh, criminal uh, annals. He actually uh, he, he was actually able to, to to pull from the annals of history. Um, it was uh, Palmer and Pritchard, I believe, mm. uh, that uh, that were two of the uh, the physicians that he mentioned in. Uh, speckled man, it would have been. Uh, Palmer and Pritchard were among the heads of their profession, uh, and mm. and of course to the to the popular uh, public back then, it would have been akin to, oh, I don't know, um, Kevorkian. You know, if you mentioned Doctor Kevorkian's name today, and um, and and folks would at least have a passing familiarity with who that was. And uh, and what they did. So I guess these were two very well-known um, murderers in the time. William Palmer uh, being the one known as uh, Rugely the Poisoner or the Prince of Poisoners. Uh, he was found uh, guilty in one of the most notorious cases in the uh, 19th century. He was only 31 years old when he was uh, put to death. Uh, but I guess he poisoned. But think of what he'd accomplished in those. I know, right? More than, years. more certainly more than I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he poisoned uh, his. Uh, what was it John Cook? Uh, poisoned him with strychnine. Again, you know, if you're going to do this, make it look like an accident at least, folks. Don't use something that isn't normally found in someone's circulation. And certainly, don't go murdering someone who had just inherited 12,000 pounds. Means and motive, right there. So, so yeah, I think, uh, you know, again, we see Conan Doyle as, um, if, if not being among the first, at least being one who popularized some of these notions. Yeah. Well, and beyond poisons and things like that, there's also other aspects of science that Holmes, I believe, was the first to employ, for example, math. It must be the first use of trigonometry in a mystery story in the Musgrave ritual. I can't imagine anybody had done anything quite like that before. Mm. 
That's true. And we have railroad speed. In, that's right. Uh, that's in Silver Blaze, isn't it? Silver Red? Blaze. That's the calculation. That's the it calculation is not a simple one. Posts. And yeah. then there's uh, poor old Cadogan West. You know, it's physics that uh, <laughs> that spins Cadogan West off the top of that railroad that's car. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. A body in motion will stay in motion. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, and in that case, that body at rest stayed in rest. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and then, uh, you know, you, you look at the, well, similarly too with, uh, the will of, um, uh, oh gosh, what's, uh, what's his name from, um, Norwood Builder. Norwood Builder. Jonas Oldacre. Right. When, when, when his handwriting, Jones. uh, got a little, uh, undiscernible, uh, Holmes determined, well, that's when he hit the points on the, on the railway. He knew how, the, the physics of the railway worked. Yeah, very yeah. clever. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what that I think. Should, that should one work. of the things that contributes to the um, undying popularity of Sherlock Holmes, which is that, as he himself observed several times, his methods are founded on observation and detail and trifles. But the reader is left with the idea that this window into this exciting world mm. and into having insights and developing understanding that other people don't have can come through observation. And so maybe, I mean, how many of us mm. have read the stories of Sherlock Holmes and then said to ourselves, I wonder how many steps there are between my front door <laughs> and the first floor. I wonder, uh, you know, and so you start to observe. That's true, and and I think that's again one of the reasons that Holmes as a character uh, continues to remain popular, even though the the skills are sometimes elusive. You know, again, as we spoke with Michael Sims in episode one seventeen, uh, we we observed that Conan Doyle himself sat at this the the feet of Joseph Bell and watched him do this stuff. It, it's a matter of paying attention. It's a matter of knowing. What's relevant and what isn't, um, and and again, it's not just the observation; it's the conclusions one draws. We we do this in our consulting practice. Uh, uh, you know, clients clamor for more data, and we say, "Look, you already have all the data you need. It, it's now time to start doing something with the data. It's start start analyzing it. Start drawing conclusions. Start making some insights based on what you see." They may be wrong, uh, they may go halfway down the road, but at least you're starting to get yourself in the right direction of moving away from just observing and moving into uh, concluding. Mm. Well, and that's the exciting part about this work, which is starting with the research, starting with the data, drawing a conclusion, and then tying that very tight line between that research insight and strategies and tactics and seeing if it works. Uh. Yes. Ah. With that sound always comes relief. I think. Uh, it means that is time for the editor's gas lamp. And in this case, we are turning once again back to the gas lamp. I know we've had a few episodes here where we've gone a little bit a, a little bit off script. We've used things that stood in for the actual gas lamp in our gas lamps, but this time we want to go back to the very beginning. That's right, where it all started. Volume 1, number 1 of the old series. It's entitled The Game is a Foot. It is altogether fitting that Sherlock Holmes should be honored by the publication of a journal devoted to a critical analysis of his life and times. No other man has ever been so honored before him, but then no other life has ever lent itself so completely to affectionate dissection. No other times have offered quite so full of flavor of the stuff of which our dreams are made. While yet the memory of Sherlock Holmes is green, and that will be as long as the spirit of adventurous enterprise is still astir in human hearts, there will be those who will be moved to write in loving tribute to the master 
and his works. They will address themselves in their devotion to the man himself and to the things he thought and said and did. And they will take within their scope as well the London street in which he lived and the room in which he sat and the brave devoted friend who stood and fought beside him when he sallied forth upon the chase. It is well that this is so. The urge is in us all to give expression to the things we think and feel. And Holmes himself, it will be recalled, endorsed this literary bent in no uncertain terms. Speaking to Victor Hatherley, when that apollocate engineer had poured his story forth, and how we might wish he had been speaking to John H. Watson instead, he made his dictum plain. You have only to put it into words, he said, to gain the reputation of being excellent company for the remainder of your existence. And since Holmes was never one to give voice to apothems in a vacuum, he practiced what he preached. He put into words over the years his observations and conclusions on an amazing variety of subjects, from tobacco ashes and tattoo marks to the tracing of footsteps and the art of malingering. He produced, among his other masterpieces, two profound philological treatises, a definitive work on the polyphonic motets of Lassus, a highly specialized anatomical exegesis, and, for measure not so good, two pot-boiling detective stories. Yet all of these fruits of Holmes's genius are lost to us today, with the exception of his relatively feeble contributions to the field of fiction and through the single precious copy which has survived his practical handbook of bee culture with some observations upon the segregation of the queen. The disappearance of this great body of Holmesian literature to mankind's irreparable loss can be ascribed only to the fact that the master had no regular, ready, and sympathetic repository for the products of his pen. Too often his small brochures and trifling monographs were entrusted to the hands of the private printer or given to one of those obscure magazines which catered so exclusively to the undiscerning that they can now themselves no longer be discerned. His book of life, it is true, found its way into publication presumably of some pretensions. Was it the Cornhill magazine? Despite Watson's offhand appraisal of the piece as ineffable twaddle, the essay on the confirmation of the human ear appeared in two installments, circa 1884, in the Anthropological Journal, which cannot now, for some unfortunate reason, be located in the libraries of the world. And there is, of course, but this is probably merely in fulfillment of a long-established Watsonian tradition, the selection of the Strand Magazine in November and December 1926 for the not-brief-enough excursion into the field of fiction. Otherwise, Holmes' choice of media for the recording and transmission of his genius was, as the result has proved, incredibly bad. To those who follow in his footsteps, there is no longer any danger that a similar descent into limbo will be the inevitable fate of their outgivings. We have already had, as warranty of this, our Baker Street Studies, our 221B, our Profile by Gaslight, and our Baker Street Four-Wheeler, with the promise that other volumes of Collectiana will make their appearance in the years to come. And now, as a current and continuing medium for preserving to posterity the writings in the Holmesian lore, we have this Baker Street Journal. The journal is dedicated to the proposition that there is still infinitely much to be said about the scene in Baker Street, and that it is of the first importance to safeguard the meritorious offerings laid upon our common shrine from that swift oblivion to which, by a heedless and unheeding world, they might otherwise be condemned. In the purpose 
an intent which honors by its very terms and the name and fame of Sherlock Holmes, the journal's course of destiny will run. Excellent. What lovely sentiments. Edgar always seems to do the trick. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> well, uh, folks, if you are of the mind, if you have some softness in your heart toward us, remember that Patreon link or that PayPal button. That would be very helpful. But also, just reach out and touch us. Let us know. And, and it doesn't matter what form of technology you use. Could be the telephone. Or you could call us at 774-221-READ. That's mm-hmm. 774-221-7323. Or, or you can email us, comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. You could go to Facebook. You could go to Tumblr. You could go to Twitter. You can go every place. We're all there at I Hear of Sherlock. Let me tell you where you can go. Um, no. <laughs> You can comment right here on this show. Show notes are available at ihose.co slash ihose120. And uh, we will look forward to having you join us here next time for episode 121 with a fantastic interview. In the meantime, I am dedicated to remain Scott Monty. I'm completely committed to serve as Burt Walder for at least the next 90 minutes. <laughs> The game's afoot! You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.